Hello everyone. Today I am going to discuss about important questions from Anastasia for NEET PG exam. First question is, in airway assessment it is said to be adequate if grade 4 palampati score, narrow mental distance is more than 6.5 cm, mouth opening is one finger width, Sterno mental distance is less than 12.5 cm. The correct answer is thyro mental distance is more than 6.5 cm. What is this airway assessment method? In this, we will assess the airway. There are many methods. First one is Malampati score. This is the most commonly used method. Malampati score or grades. This is to assess the size of tongue for laryngoscopy. Grade 1 is, we can see fascial pillars, uvula with tip and soft palate. Pillars, uvula, uvula with the tip and soft palate. Grade 2 is, we can see uvula without the tip. That is, we can see only base and soft palate. In grade 3, we can see only soft palate. Only soft palate. Whereas in grade 4, we can see only hard palate. So, if these grades are present, it is not adequate. Airway is not adequate. And second method is measurement of thyro mental distance. Thyro mental distance it should be more than 6.5 cm. And third one is sterno mental distance. It should be more than 12.5 cm. In, in auction it is given as less than 12.5 cm. So sterno mental distance should be more than 12.5 cm. The fourth one is there should be adequate mouth opening. What is meant by adequate mouth opening? There should be three finger width, three finger width or more than two centimeter. There should be movement of cervical spine. ASA grading that is American Society of Anesthesiologist grading. It determines the physical status of the patient before any surgery. There are six grades. First grade is patient is healthy. Patient is healthy. No systemic diseases. Patient is non-smoker. Minimal or non-alcoholic. This is grade one. Grade 2 is patient will be having mild systemic illness. Which is under control. Mild systemic illness which is well controlled with no functional limitation with no functional limitation examples are controlled hypertension controlled diabetes mellitus pregnancy patients with bmi 30 to 40 social drinker grade 3 is patient will be having severe systemic illness with functional limitation with functional limitation Example is uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, stable angina, BMI more than 40, alcohol dependence, end stage, end stage renal diseases, who is on a regular dialysis and more than 3 months history of myocardial infarction, transient ischemic attacks, any stents, more than 3 months history of myocardial infarction. In grade 4 is severe systemic illness which is a constant threat to life of the patient. Example is unstable angina, 
diabetic ketoacidosis, severe reduction of ejection fraction, end stage renal disease with irregular dialysis and within three months history of myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular accidents, transient ischemic attacks or stents. Grade 5 is moribund patients unlikely to survive without surgeries. Examples of ruptured thoracic or abdominal aneurysm, intracranial bleed with midline shift, massive trauma. Sixth one is brain dead patient. So they can be taken for organ donation. Brain dead patient. Sixth grade is there is one symbol called as E. This is used for emergency patients. So this is about ASA grading. Next question is all of the following drugs to be continued on the day of surgery except anticonvulsant, insulin, pyroxene, steroid. The correct answer is insulin. Insulin has to be stopped on the day of surgery because patient will be nil per orally. So if you give insulin, patient will go into hypoglycemia. So we should stop the morning dose of insulin or any oral antidiabetics. What are the drugs that can be given on the day of surgery? To be given on the day of surgery. Levodopa, anticonvulsant, progesterone only pill, antihypertensive, except ACE inhibitor or ARB because they will cause refractory hypotension. Nitrates, any thyroid drugs, steroids, statins. These are the drugs they have to be continued on the day of surgery. Morning dose has to be given. What are the drugs that has to be stopped before surgery? That is to be stopped. First one is insulin or oral hypoglycemic drugs. Second one is warfarin. Ideally, this has to be stopped 4 to 5 days before the surgery. Low molecular weight heparin. This can be given, that is last dose can be given 12 to 14 hours before surgery. Unfractioned heparin. The last dose can be given 6 hours before surgery. Combined OCP. Combined OCP has to be stopped 4 weeks before surgery because there will be increased risk of thromboembolism. So, OCP has to be stopped 4 weeks before the surgery. Lithium. Lithium has to be stopped 2 days before surgery. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs has to be stopped two days prior to surgery. Sildenafil. It has to be stopped 24 hours before surgery. Aspirin. Based on depends on dose, this has to be stopped. Low dose aspirin can be continued on the day of surgery except can be continued 
except in case of closed space surgeries like brain surgery spinal cord surgeries or eye surgery in these cases like in closed space surgery we can't give low dose aspirin on the day of surgery if patient is on aspirin and dose is more than 75 mg so this has to be stopped to 3 to 5 days before the surgery if patient is on clopidogrel it has to be stopped 7 days prior to surgery and ideally patient has to quit smoking before 6 to 8 weeks of surgery smoking causes decrease in surfactant level and it decreases the potency of amino steroid muscle relaxant so the next question is laryngeal mask airway is contraindicated in all except pregnant patients esophageal fistula patients patients with difficult airway morbidly obese patients the correct answer is patients with difficult airway so what is this laryngeal mask airway laryngeal mask airway it is a supraglottic device these are the supraglottic devices so laryngeal mask airways these are the supraglottic devices what are the advantages of these devices we can insert easily we do not require laryngoscope or muscle relaxant and it can be used in difficult airways difficult airways so what are the disadvantages it do not prevent the aspiration of gastric contents so we can't be used in patients with recent meals or in case of pregnant women and it may cause gastric distension these are the disadvantages of laryngeal mask airway so largest possible size should be used because it forms better oropharyngeal seal so what is the disadvantage of using largest possible sizes it causes sore throat so contraindication for laryngeal mask airway full stomach patients that is pregnant patients patients having recent meal tracheoesophageal fistula patients and patients with low pulmonary compliance that is morbidly obese patients we can't use laryngeal mask airway and patients with oral pathologies that is pharyngeal abscess inadequate mouth opening hemorrhage or bleeding in the oral cavity so there is one more terminology called goodell's oropharyngeal airway oropharyngeal airway this prevents the fall of tongue during anesthesia it prevents fall of tongue during anesthesia the size depends on distance between angle of mouth and tragus angle of mouth and tragus this size depends on distance between angle of mouth and tragus in case of nasopharyngeal airway the size depends on distance between nose and tragus the next question is predictors of difficult laryngoscopy include all except long upper incisors malampati grade score is 1 short neck high arched palate the correct answer is option b most commonly we use curved blade laryngoscope curved blade laryngoscope so we use the laryngoscope and we will hold the laryngoscope with left hand 
the position of patient is sniffing position position of the patient is sniffing position so what is this sniffing position there will be extension at atlanto occipital joint atlanto occipital joint and there is flexion at neck so this is sniffing position it causes it brings the oral pharyngeal laryngeal areas in a straight line so that we can put laryngoscope most common structure damage during laryngoscopy is upper incisors most common structure damaged so what are the predictors of difficult laryngoscopy predictors of difficult laryngoscopy first one is long upper incisors second one is prominent overbite third one is malampati grade score is 3 or 4 that is only soft palate or hard palate is seen in ability to protrude mandible forward in ability to protrude mandible forward short neck and thyromental distal if it is less than 6.5 cm high arched palate and limited cervical mobility cervical mobility is limited these are the predictors for difficult airway difficult air so using laryngoscope we will usually insert endotracheal tube there are two most commonly used endotracheal tubes one is red rubber one is pvc pipes so what are the tests to confirm the presence of et in trachea what are the tests to confirm first one is there will be chest movement rise and fall of chest and we can auscultate by auscultating breath sounds usually at base usually at left side of the base we will auscultate for breath sounds and fogging fogging in case of pvc tubes and chest x ray in case of pvc because it will be having a radio opaque line so we can check the position of endotracheal tube using chest x ray and gold standard method is capnography capnography we will estimate the expired carbon dioxide so usually it will be around 35 to 45 mm hd we will estimate the carbon dioxide endotracheal tubes in case of children what is the difference between children and adult intubation so in children we will use uncuffed endotracheal tube up to age of 6 years and minimal permissive leak is allowed so we will allow leak it should be minimal if leak is high patient will not get ventilated properly no proper ventilation if leak is high if leak is low or if there is no leak that means the tube is too tight and there will be tracheal mucosal edema which decreases the radius of trachea so there will be markedly reduction in air flow 
there is one most commonly asked question what is the narrowest part in children that is subglottic area so what is the narrowest part in adults that is glottic area this is endotracheal tube so what is meant by nasotracheal intubation nasotracheal intubation this endotracheal intubation we will insert the tube through mouth but in this nasotracheal intubation we will insert through nose to trachea so what are the indications for nasotracheal intubation if there is fracture of mandible if we are doing oral surgeries and if there is inadequate mouth opening and tube has to be kept for longer time we will use nasotracheal intubation what are the contraindication for this nasotracheal intubation so if there is base of skull fracture if there is cs of rhinorrhea and if there is nasal mass if there is adenoids if any coagulopathy present these are the contraindication for nasotracheal intubation we have to insert the tube through nose so any nasal pathologies any skull base fracture we should not use nasotracheal tube so what are the contraindication for oro and nasal intubation so we can't use tube through mouth and through nose also what are the contraindication for both if there is severe laryngeal edema and severe epiglottitis and laryngotracheal bronchitis laryngo tracheo bronchitis in these cases we can't use oro or nasal intubation we have to do tracheostomy next question is all of the following affect the height of blockade in spinal anesthesia except dose volume direction of needle varicity the correct answer is direction of needle so what are the factors that affect the height of blockade factors affecting height of the blockade one is dose it is most important factor so if we are giving high dose then it increases the blockade level so there will be high blockade so second one is bericity that is specific gravity of drug with respect to csf so in head down position there the height of blockade will be more third one is volume higher the dose higher the level of blockade position in case of sitting position the height of blockade will be less whereas in case of head down position the height of blockade will be more so patient factors in case of old age we need low level of drug and in case of pregnancy also we will use low dosage in case of taller patient we need more volume so what are the factors which do not affect the height of blockade which do not affect the height of blockade only sex or gender it doesn't matter whether it is male or female weight of the patient except morbidly obese patient and direction of needle speed of injection and addition of any vasoconstrictor so these are these do not affect the height of blockade in case of spinal anesthesia what is this spinal anesthesia 
we will inject the anesthetic material in subarachnoid space. Spinal cord ends. In case of adults, it ends at the level of lower border of L1 or upper border of L2. Whereas in case of children, it ends at lower border of L2 and upper border of L3. So we will inject the spinal anesthesia at the level of L2 to L3 or L5 or S1. So in this level, we will give spinal anesthesia. So what are the structures that are punctured during the spinal anesthesia? First is skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum plavum, ligamentum plavum, dura mater and arachnoid. So it is subarachnoid. So which all drugs we will use? Drugs used are most common clignocaine that is 5% heavy or bupivacaine 0.5% heavy. What is this mean by heavy? Heavy is specific gravity of drug with respect to CSF. So we will make the drug as heavy by adding 8% dextrose. We will add 8% dextrose to make it heavy. So what are the systemic effects of these drugs? That is what are the systemic effects of spinal anesthesia? What are the systemic effects? First one is, so it causes sympathetic blockade. So parasympathetic will be overactive. That is, it dominates. Parasympathetic dominates and sympathetic blockade. So on cardiovascular system, it causes hypotension and tachycardia. Usually spinal anesthesia will cause hypotension and tachycardia but if we are giving high spinal anesthesia it causes hypotension and bradycardia. On CNS it has effect on autonomic nervous system, sensory and motor. So easiest way to check is first we will check sensory by using pin prick. So, If there is sensory blockade present, two segments above that will be autonomic blockade and two segments below this will be motor blockade, the level of motor blockade. On respiratory system, it doesn't affect much but if we are giving high spinal anesthesia, it can block the phrenic nerve so it causes apnea. And effect on temperature there will be increased heat loss which compensate in the form of shivering so usually post operative patient will complain of shivering after spinal anesthesia on GIT there will be small contracted gut so there will be increased peristalsis and relaxation of sphincters and genito urinary system there will be urinary retention this is also most commonly seen in post op patient after spinal anesthesia so there will be blockage of detrusor muscle that is s2 s3 s4 that's why post operative patients after spinal anesthesia patient will complains of urinary retention so what are the complications of spinal anesthesia what are the complication? First one will be hypotension. So this can be prevented by preloading the patient with before surgery only. They will give fluids 1 liter to 1.5 liter of fluid either crystalloids or colloids. And if at all patient is 
having hypotension we can treat it by fast iv fluid head down position and we can use vasopressors if at all it, it is not reducing if at all the patient is not improving on fluids so second complication is bradycardia so we can give atropine so third complication is respiratory insufficiency so we can give intermittent positive pressure ventilation with bag and mask fourth complication is post spinal headache or post dural puncture headache so this is also most common it is due to leakage of csf usually it occurs 12 to 24 hours after the surgery and it can last for 7 days usually there will be occipital headache and it increases on sitting or standing position and it improves on lying down position so post spinal headache can be prevented by using pencil tip needle or higher gaze needle and by giving adequate hydration so what is the treatment we can give analgesics correct the dehydration we can give coffee and we can give epidural blood patch what is this epidural blood patch we will take around 15 ml of blood from antiquital fossa and we will inject into epidural space which seals the puncture site so there won't be any leakage of csf fifth complication is epidural hematoma and there can be paralysis of cranial nerves like sixth cranial nerve which causes diplopia and there can be back ache or rare complication like meningitis so what are the absolute contraindication for spinal anesthesia absolute contraindication for spinal anesthesia anything that causes raised intracranial tension and if patient is refusing for spinal anesthesia this is also absolute contraindication and severe hypovolemia and if patient is having severe aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis and if there is infection at local site so we should not give spinal anesthesia and coagulopathy so if we are giving spinal anesthesia the patient platelet should be more than 80000 and inr should be less than 1.5 so there is one more terminology called saddle anesthesia saddle anesthesia so what is this saddle anesthesia it is one of the modification of spinal anesthesia so spinal anesthesia is given in sitting position and patient is allowed to sit for about 8 to 10 minutes so the anesthetic effect will come in the form of saddle that's why it is called saddle anesthesia it can be given in all perineal surgeries perineal surgeries we can give saddle anesthesia so these are the few important questions from anesthesia for neat pg exams if you like this video please like the video and for further videos please subscribe to my youtube channel and share to your friends thank you